This is part one of two PowerPoints that take up the Wobblies and Blanket Stiffs reading. This reading is by Ross McCormick. It's called Wobblies and Blanket Stiffs, the constituency of the IWW in Western Canada. We'll be discussing frontier workers, ethnically split labor markets, and early, particularly industrial union activities. These PowerPoints answer the Wobblies and Blanket Stiffs reading questions, and they can also be used to fill in the blanks on the downloadable PowerPoint that I've posted for you. Let's get started. So this picture gives you an idea what your average railway or railroad construction site looked like. All right, so take a close look here. So what are some things that are noticeable differences between construction sites today? So first of all, look at the lack of hard hats. Probably uh, the men who were better off could afford steel-toed boots. Probably many of them were just working in whatever boots they had. Look at how many men there are. So the Wobblies and Blanket Stiffs worked across Canada and much of the US in a period before we had uh, bulldozers, uh, heavy equipment, um, etc. And so when you don't have a bunch of heavy equipment, what you do have is a lot of laborers. Okay, so you can see the, the tracks um, for the railroad are going to go in um, to the left of the image here. Right? And you can see um, what the gentlemen who work these jobs generally look like. Okay, so And we're talking largely men here, as, uh, as Mr. McCormick says right at the beginning of his article. And you can see there's one gentleman here carrying a railroad tie on the left hand of the picture. Right Next to him, there's a gentleman standing with a pickaxe. And then you can see other gentlemen with shovels. All of these fellows, this was their work. All right? So it was unskilled work. And um, it was basically done in these large, large groups in these frontier areas. So you'll notice in the background of the picture uh, on the left hand side, you can see a tent and then you can see some um, sheds or cabins. Um, those would have been where the workers lived during this chunk of the railroad construction. And those um, tents would have uh, picked up and moved along to the next um, sort of few miles of railroad construction as the construction proceeded. Um, many of the cabins were also just hastily built, uh, etc. So this is a picture um, from 1898, right? And uh, when it says the city here, what it means is the workers city where the workers lived, okay? So let's proceed. So in the first page of the reading, uh, Mr. McCormick talks about who the blanket stiffs were. So as I said already, they were men, right? Um, they were unskilled workers, right? They were foreign born. Um, they were uh, mostly Eastern or Southern European, as he talks about, and they were migrant workers, all right? So they were, um, uh, some of the Ukrainians also settled, um, but most of these men were moving around. They did not have a permanent home in Canada. So they referred to themselves as blanket stiffs because they've traveled from job to job with their possessions rolled in a blanket and the blanket would be tied with a couple of belts and the belts would be the straps for a sort of makeshift backpack. So blanket stiffs with all their uh, belongings uh, in that little pack. Before 1914, 1914 was the beginning of World War I, there were about 50,000 of them working in labor intensive industries across Canada and parts of the US. So especially railroad construction and resource sector jobs. So that'd be mining, forestry, fish canneries, etc. The blanket stiffs traveled around Canada and the US felling trees, harvesting wheat, mucking ore, which is a way of talking about mining, and driving spikes, so working on the railroad. Some of the earliest blanket stiffs were Irish workers. And this is a monument um, to a thousand Irish workers and their families who died building the Rideau Canal um, between 1826 and 1832. So both the Rideau Canal and the Welland Canal were built by early blanket stiffs. Um, and a lot of Irish labor was involved in that. Um, the conditions were terrible. Uh, this particular cross is partly because um, the Irish workers uh, and their families weren't just building the canal, they were living in the canal. So as they were building this big trough um, in the earth uh, to divert a river through, um, their, their camps, um, their 
they were living in tents and these tents were built sort of in the bottom of this big pit that they were building so it was constantly damp it was dirty um, and uh, there were a couple of diseases that uh, went through the camp and because the conditions were terrible they killed lots and lots of people the work was also stunningly dangerous as we will talk about later so McCormick talks about how um, the sort of preferred uh, workers for the railroad were first the Irish, he talks about Irish navvies, and the Chinese, he talks about Chinese coolies, um, but, uh, and uh, he also talks about the other groups. So let's just run through them here. So Chinese workers uh, in the late 1800s, all right, you'll remember that the first Chinese started coming to Canada around 1850, um, built the BC line of the CPR. CPR stands for Canadian Pacific Railroad. Make sure you know that acronym, right? Um, and the employers would have preferred to continue um, uh, using largely Chinese labor. Um, the Chinese workers were often paid a third what white workers were paid, um, and uh, employers could treat them pretty much however they wanted. However, there was some pretty intense anti-Chinese racism, we'll be talking about that next week when we talk about Asian workers, um, among white Canadians. Uh, and this led to immigration restrictions being imposed on the Chinese, and we'll talk more about that all next week. Irish workers started uh, were kind of the earliest blanket stiffs. So they began in the early 1800s. Um, as I was saying, they built the Rideau and the Welland Canals and much of the earliest railroads. However, Irish immigration to Canada peaked um, around the time of the Irish famine. You'll remember that from the Isidu reading, um, which was 1846-1847. Uh, uh, and so after mid, the mid-1800s, there were fewer and fewer workers coming from Ireland, which is why they did not continue to make up the bulk of the blanket stiff workforce. At the beginning of the economic boom uh, around the turn of the century, so around 1897, um, there were British and Welsh workers who were employed doing railroad work. However, um, they reacted loudly and violently. They pushed back against the really terrible work and living conditions um, that railroad work entailed. Um, and so employers did not want to hire the British and the Welsh. Um, McCormick has a quote in the reading from uh, a boss who says that the, the British expect high wages uh, and feather beds, right? So uh, they were not the favored employees um, of the bosses. Now, the bosses uh, liked Italians. However, the bureaucrats um, in the Canadian government preferred Eastern Europeans. Um, Eastern Europeans were more white uh, as far as the, the bureaucrats were concerned. Um, Italians were not considered white men at the time. Um, and uh, Eastern European Slavs um, were sort of considered white, sometimes considered white. Um, and, uh, and so the bureaucrats preferred uh, the Eastern Europeans. So in the early 1900s, um, there was uh, lots of Eastern European uh, labor imported um, to work on the railroad. However, the bosses also um, disliked uh, the Eastern European workers because they uh, they tended to want to homestead. So many of them were peasants, they were farmers in their homes, and they had come to Canada told they could farm here. Um, and so many of them got those homesteads that we talked about in the Isidu reading, um, and they would work for the railroad or uh, for a logging company or for a mine um, for a period of time. And they would save up their money so that they could buy uh, an ox or a wagon or a plow or things that they needed for the farm. And then they would quit and they would go home and they would use that money um, to develop their farm, okay? So they were more settler laborers. <coughs> Boss's absolute preference for workers were Italian workers. Um, the reading also refers to them sometimes as Mediterranean workers. The bureaucrats in Ottawa considered Italians racially undesirable. As I said, they were not considered white. Um, but business owners wanted Italian workers um, because Italian workers uh, did not settle. Um, they stayed on the job. Um, they were generally controlled by padrones. They accepted low wages. Uh, they did not assimilate. They did not learn English, which kept them away from newspapers and politics and trade unions. Right. Um, so Italian workers were really the preference of bosses. <clears throat> 
So I wanted to give you an idea who we're talking about when we're talking about bosses. So this is a photograph uh, of a number of railroad executives, right? So you'll notice that they have a few things in common. They're white, they're not exactly young, and they're dudes. Um, this very opulent setting is a luxury train car, right? Um, and uh, these gentlemen, um, most of them would have not really done any physical labor a single day in their lives. They had servants who uh, did all of their housework for them, drove their carriages, emptied their chamber pots, um, dressed them in the morning, uh, took notes for them at meetings, made sure they got to appointments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So these gentlemen knew nothing about the conditions uh, that the workers we're going to be talking about worked under, um, and frankly, they did not care. Um, their main priority was scraping as much profit uh, out of this as humanly possible. So why did employers prefer unassimilated immigrant workers? So particularly uh, Italian workers and Chinese workers. Um, and we could ask the same question today because when we get to um, week seven and we talk about um, temporary foreign workers, um, one of the things you will note is how popular uh, the use of unassimilated workers, workers who have few rights is with bosses. So. The railroad executives preferred the Italian immigrants because they remained in the unskilled workforce. All right? They didn't go and settle on farms like the Eastern European workers. They kept moving around, so they didn't integrate into Anglo-Canadian society. So as I said already, they were kept away from unions, newspapers, and politics generally. One railroad executive said that Italian workers are the strength of the employer and the weakness of the union. So what he meant by that is that when um, workers organized, and when I say workers organized, what I mean is they joined a union, not that they you know, tidied their closets, right? Um, then uh, often what bosses would do, because there were no laws that said that bosses had to deal with unions back then, um, what bosses would do um, is they would bring in uh, a bunch of workers from a different culture who could not communicate with the workers who were on strike, so they couldn't find out why the workers were on strike or what they were striking about, because um, uh, most of the strikes were about terrible conditions and terrible treatment. Right? So the Italian workers were often brought in um, when other workers were on strike. So the executive also said how to head off a strike of muckers, those are uh, miners, or laborers for higher wages without the help of Italian labor, I do not know. So the bosses would break the strikes and try and break the unions by bringing in Italian workers who didn't belong to unions and giving them the jobs of the guys who were on strike. So most of these folks um, came over to North America on boats, right? Um, there was no airplanes back then. Um, so I wanted to give you kind of an idea of what the, the trip and the conditions um, that most of these folks had endured in order to get to Canada were like, all right? So um, hopefully y'all have seen the Titanic because um, that's the best way I know how to explain this, all right? So in the Titanic, you have... Um, uh, the rich lady, uh, and she's above decks, right? She has a fancy room that's kind of like a hotel room. But then you have Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, I can't even remember his character's name. Um, but he is in steerage. So steerage um, is big, big rooms uh, down in the bottom of the boat. So often they didn't even have windows. And um, these immigrants would have been jammed into those rooms, right? Um, the, the boats uh, the boat captains could make the most money um, if they jammed as many people onto their boat as they possibly could. So they collected as many fares as they could, which meant for really crowded and unhealthy conditions. So in steerage, there was not necessarily any kind of toilet, right? There would have been buckets full of human waste um, that someone would empty over the decks uh, every now and then. So, and lots of people would be seasick. So you have to picture a big crowded room with a lot of dirty people who are smelly. You have to picture the smell of vomit and feces, right? It's dark, it's dank, it's uncomfortable. Um, and uh, good boat captains uh, would allow the immigrants to come up onto deck for a couple hours every day. Um, so this is what is happening in this picture. All the immigrants that were in steerage down below have been allowed to come up to stand on, um, on the deck of the ship um, for a period to get some air, right? Um, so this is a, a boatload of European immigrants. You can see how crowded it is, right? You can see how many people there are, right? And these people are not wealthy, 
right? They are poor, um, and that is why they are in steerage. So this is the kind of scene that um, many of the, the Wobblies and Blanket Stiffs experienced on their way to Canada. So new immigrants were supplied to their employers by um, these passenger or steamship agents. Okay, so there were these business deals between the steamship companies and the industries that needed workers, right? And often the government helped um, these deals go down or paid a bonus to the, the companies for each immigrant that they brought into the country, um, etc. right? So there were passenger or steamship agents in Europe. Uh, and we talked a bit about this in the ECJU reading. Um, these were these sort of used car salesmen gentlemen, and they uh, would recruit immigrants and ship them out of European and British ports. So Canadian Pacific Lines, this steamship company, supplied the workers for the Canadian Pacific Railroad subsidiaries and its contractors. So Allen Lines, which was a steamship company, had a contract with the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad to supply workers, right? So, and there were lots of deals like that. These companies shipped thousands of workers to North America annually, and then employment agencies in Canada, um, kind of like temp agencies today, right? Um, these agencies were often associated with the steamship companies, um, and these agents uh, were sort of subcontracted by the railway construction companies or the mining companies or the logging companies to supply workers, right? So uh, the immigration agents we'll talk about a little bit more because they often cheated the workers. So this gentleman um, was talked about in the Isuju reading, um, and I thought you should get a look at him. This is Clifford Stifton. Um, he was the minister of the interior. The interior kind of means the prairies. Um, and uh, he's often credited uh, with um, sort of loading Canada's white population um, in the period uh, at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s. Um, Clifford Sifton was born a millionaire, all right? Again, like the railroad executives, never worked uh, a hard manual day in his life, right? Um, and he was the architect of the immigration policy in this period. So this is a period when immigration policy is first of all, very racist, um, but second of all, largely controlled by bosses and corporations. Um, and that is uh, Sifton's handiwork, okay? So the Canadian government um, knew that the steamship agents uh, and the employment agencies um, were, uh, were basically fleecing the immigrants and the workers. Um, they knew uh, that uh, despite the rules that said that the immigrants were supposed to be agricultural immigrants, that most of them were being brought here for unskilled industrial and frontier work. Right. Um, so Donald Avery, who's, uh, whose work we're probably reading next week, um, he traced uh, these huge bonuses that were paid to these uh, steamship agents and employment agencies um, for supplying uh, uh, agricultural immigrants. It was the government that was paying these bonuses, um, even though these immigrants were not in any way agricultural immigrants. Um, everyone knew that employment agencies um, were cheating uh, and exploiting and lying to workers. So journalists knew, uh, government bureaucrats knew, cops knew, um, the, the ministers and priests of various churches knew, all right? And they all supported workers saying, hey, the, these, these employment agents um, keep cheating us, they keep defrauding us, right? But the Canadian government didn't go near the employment agencies um, didn't start regulating them or in any way monitoring the things they did until after the railroad construction boom was over and after Canada had a Trans-Canada Railway, then they began to actually pass regulations around these things. So this is an Eastern European family from Galicia um, that has just arrived um, in the prairies. Okay, so uh, this is a pretty typical Eastern European family. Now remember, most of the Blankistists we're talking about came here single, right? Um, some of them came with families, but the vast majority came here single and they were trying to raise money to bring their families so their families could have lives here as well, right? So you can see uh, some of the things that are typical about this family is first of all, there's lots of kids, right? So we got six kids. Um, Second of all, these are farm people, all right? These are not city people. 
Uh, thirdly, you can see their few possessions are kind of piled behind them there. There's a little suitcase and a couple of other things. And that is the, the extent of what most of the peasant families that arrived in Canada had. So this family here has just uh, gotten off the train. Um, it's detrained um, at a, a prairie railroad station. And they will probably walk from here to the chunk of land that is their homestead, carrying um, all their belongings, basically, um, and begin trying to carve out a life as pioneers uh, on the prairies. How are workers cheated and exploited by employment agents and employment agencies? So a blanket stiff who worked on the railroad and belonged to the industrial workers of the world, so a wobbly, that is what we called the members of the IWW, they were called wobblies. A railroad wobbly in Northern Ontario described the system um, that these folks used to rip off the workers, to cheat the workers. They send you out on a job for a $1 fee. So remember, back then a dollar was basically a day's wage, so it's pretty, that's a pretty big deal. Right? and give you a contract with certain information. But when you get to the work camp, the boss gives you different orders. I learned a few facts in the last two weeks. I was out of town twice and came back again. I lost $2 and about $10 in fare and train ticket, and I can't see the end of the robbery. When you come back and go to the office, this would be the employment agent's office, asking for the return of your fee because they didn't give you the job that they told you they were going to, the shark chases you out. Okay. So the foreman on the jobs and the agents would work together. The foreman would fire members of his constru construction game and replace them with men who had paid the uh, employment agent uh, money for the job. This picture is a picture of coal miners um, in uh, the extension coal mines um, in British Columbia. Okay, uh, so I wanted you to get a sense of uh, what these workers looked like because it helps you get a sense of the job. Okay, so um, take a look. Now, first of all, there are a couple people in here who are not coal miners. You can see a couple young men um, in pork pie hats uh, over on the right side here. All right, so those guys are not coal miners. Um, they might have been children of the coal miners. Um, they might have been the foreman's kids. Who knows? All right, um, you can tell who the miners are because they are wearing these hats. Um, and what the hats have on them um, is basically a, a little piece of metal that's bent around um, into a, sort of a rounded shape behind uh, a little stem that they would stick a candle on. All right, so these gentlemen would stick a candle on that uh, stem on the hat and then the metal behind it would reflect the light out. That was basically their version of the headlamp. If you look at their faces, you can see that many of them have very dirty faces. Um, that is because they are coal miners. So they work in a coal mine in all sorts of coal dust, right? And they're sweating. And so the coal dust sticks to their faces, all right? So that's why a bunch of them have dirty faces, okay? Um, now, that illustrates one of the biggest hazards of coal mining. So if this were a picture of coal miners today, they would all be wearing breathing apparatus, right? Because coal dust um, is incredibly fine. It gets into your lungs and it gives you a disease called black lung. Um, and basically you just end up coughing up your own lungs. It's like smoking six packs of cigarettes a day. Um, it killed people. Um, so mining was an incredibly dangerous job. Now you'll notice not only are they all wearing these um, little hats, um, many of them have these buckets with them. What do you think these buckets are about? Those are their lunch buckets, all right? So when they go down into the pit, down into the mine, they take their lunches with them, all right? And they would, on a lunch break, uh, eat pretty much right where they were working, okay? So this is a picture of, uh, of what, it, what coal miners um, in this period uh, looked like. So padrones, um, who were uh, basically uh, the employment agents, uh, the, the employment subcontractors, I guess, the, the construction subcontractors um, in the Italian community, um, were not put out of operation despite the fact that they did numerous um, corrupt and unethical things. Um, the government turned a blind eye to the Italian padrones because they acted as intermediaries between Canadian bosses and the workers. 
the most notorious of the Padrones was Antonio Cordasco, um, and he supplied most of the labor um, for the Canadian Pacific Railroad um, up until it hit British Columbia. In 1904, when his unethical operations led to demonstrations, um, uh, Italian men who were unemployed demonstrated against him in Montreal. He was criticized by a royal commission. Royal commissions are um, panels that the Canadian government convenes of experts. Um, usually they are charged with looking into um, an issue that is a contentious issue. Um, and then uh, whatever their commission report says, um, the government will often adopt policy based on it. So Cordesco remained in business because as far as the boss is concerned, um, he was awesome. Right? He supplied uh, meek workers, he disciplined the workers that he supplied, um, and like I said, the bosses loved Italian workers. So historians uh, go to conferences and argue uh, about whether the padrone system uh, was a good thing or a bad thing. All right, so it was a system that was characterized by extortion um, and by intimidation. Um, the padrone um, beat up workers, uh, uh, threatened their families, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the Padrone facilitated Italians coming to Canada. They arranged uh, the steamship tickets. They sent money from the, the men's wages back to Italy to their families. They supplied Italian food um, and they basically found the jobs for these men. So this picture uh, is of um, uh, a steam engine uh, on the BC railroad line. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of things I want you to note here. So first of all, um, look at the trestle, the bridge um, that is behind uh, the workers here um, that the, the train is sort of resting on. So that ginormous uh, piece of engineering, those railroad tracks above it is made out of wood and it was made by these workers. All right, so this is a period, like I said, before um, heavy equipment, um, before you had bulldozers, lifters, etc. Um, and before the, the, the widespread use of concrete, right? So here you have a big wood trestle that was built by hand, um, probably by hundreds of workers. Okay. Um, you can tell it's British Columbia because of the big, big trees, right? Um, I also want you to take a look at the steam engine here, at the train, right? So these were huge, incredibly powerful machines. So this would have weighed many tons, right? And um, on the front, you can see there's one gentleman sitting on the front grill there. That's a cattle catcher, right? So that grill um, was to move cows and wildlife, uh, moose, bears, whatever sort of happened across the tracks, off the tracks. Um, because the trains could not stop. Um, the, the train was so heavy, it took quite some time to, to break, right? So the trains didn't stop, they just sort of barreled through. Um, so huge, huge steam engine, right? Massive piece of, uh, of equipment. Now, the other thing that I want you to note, it's difficult to tell because of the poor quality of this picture. I tried to enhance it, um, but I wasn't able to, um, is that this is a rare photo because it shows workers of um, both Chinese extraction um, and uh, who we, gentlemen that we would call white men. They may not all have been called white men back then. All right, um, so you can see this gentleman with a scarf here. He's a Chinese worker. There's a fellow with a, a big mustache here and holding a, um, a board. He's also a Chinese worker, all right? Um, and then uh, some of these other gentlemen are workers that we would call white, okay? So this is just a, a sort of picture of what uh, the, the trains looked like in that day and what the workers were building. So um, Ross McCormick talks about the ethnic heterogeneity um, that characterize railroad construction work. Um, heterogeneity means difference, right? Homogeneity means the same or sameness, right? Heterogeneity means difference. Um, so the statistics, statistics collected uh, in Northern Ontario in the early 1920s found that 32% of the workers were Slavic, so Eastern European, 25 were Scandinavian, so um, Finland, Norway, Sweden, etc. Right? 20% uh, were British, American, and English Canadian, 11% were French Canadian, 7% were Italian, and then the rest were other nationalities.
It's interesting though, looking back, because at the time, these categories didn't really matter. Um, in railway camps, you were either considered a white man or you were a wop and a bohunk. So if you were Anglo-Saxon, um, that's basically British descended, um, Scandinavian or French Canadian, you were considered a white man, all right? Um, wop was a, a, a nasty way of talking about Southern Europeans, um, and bohunk was a nasty way of talking about Eastern Europeans, right? Um, so uh, Austrian was a way of talking about Eastern Europeans, so the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and Italians were not called white, right? Whereas um, the folks who qualified as white were basically British folks, Scandinavian folks, and French Canadian folks. Um, the Grand Trunk Pacific camps in British Columbia were 80% foreigners, so people who weren't born in Canada. Russians, Swedes, Ukrainians, Bohemians, uh, Poles, Finns, Norwegians, Italians, and the odd Turk. Uh, 